She, I got many orders, so she had to try. Okay, okay. But, um, I'd love to hear from her. 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 I'd after just a few minutes. So I'm logging in here to the E2L system because there's something I do want to show you about this class. I will start the roll sheet and I'm going to start it over here on the back row because I figured this out. My big PhD educated brain figured out that if I started over there and you all pass it to the left and then it serpentines around here and then it serpentines around here, it ends up right there. So I don't have to walk as far to to pick it up. Isn't that brilliant to me to wow. figure this out? So I'll start it on the back row rather than the front row and then have to go pick it up. So we um, did a critical thinking exercise last time and I have already posted the grades for that uh, on D2L. So you should check and make sure your grades are there. It's always important if you think there is a problem with the grades, it's better to uh, let me know early so that I can correct that, get it, uh, get it corrected for you. So be sure and look at that, look at those comments if you don't see your grades in there because it went into the group folder or whatever. Let me know so that I can get you, be sure and add it to the group that you're supposed to be in. And there are opportunities for bonus points by excelling in the group and making challenges. Three groups, and so I use the news item on D2L a lot in this class to let you know. So three groups did an exceptional job on Tuesday's Critical Thinking Challenge, and they won bonus points for that exceptional job. And so I post that in the news items. I'll also post in there things like that you might want to remember, you know, like upcoming exams, <coughs> stuff like that. So be sure and look at D2L, be sure and look at your grades, be sure and watch those news items because that's a good place and a good way for me to communicate with you. I do like that feature in D2L, although D2L is kind of a bad learning management system, it's not, it's not the best one out there. So um, Smith, the dedicated marketers, and the finish line all provided exceptional responses to Tuesday's critical review challenge. Also, hopefully, as a marketer, I'm marketing to you, I'm giving you an incentive Right? We'll talk about incentives in here, pricing, models, and things like that. To do what? Attempt to win challenges on your own to get bonus points that you'll want to add to your score. So pay attention to that. So we're going to talk today about strategy. And I want to start by saying that the text really talks about a lot of these perspectives from the perspective of a major corporation. Why is that, that we want to study major corporations as marketers, baby? Why is it that we have a tendency to look at big corporations? Because they're successful, okay? That's, that's maybe one reason that we like to study them as marketers. Why might, why might be another reason? So I'm not going to do a critical thinking challenge today. I'll do individual critical thinking challenges. Um, and you can answer these questions. I like to use the Socratic method. It's one of the things that I use in the class along with using these critical thinking challenges. Why do I like the Socratic method? Because it's the method that they, my first doctor's degree is a what? Yeah, as a Juris Doctor and a Doctor of Jurisprudence. And so it's the method that they use in law school. And I like it as well because it involves you in the interaction. So I'll ask you, why is it that Academics may want to study big corporations. We've got one response that because they're successful, although are all of them always successful? No. No? no. Sears and Roebuck, one of the most successful companies, is now what? Dead. Almost dead. They're limping along. They're almost bankrupt. They're, they're about to be history. So are they always successful? No. No? No, Okay, I think that's a really important insight into this process. 
they are easy to study from an academic perspective because they provide a lot of their information. When I was a corporate general counsel, I was an executive vice president for a publicly traded company. I was responsible for filing these documents at the end of each quarter. Any of those of you who are accountants should know what this is. What's that document? 10K. The 10 case at the end of the year. Oh, the 10, 10 Q. 10Q, and then at the end of the year, I was responsible <coughs> for filing the 10K. So there's all this information out there that they provide, and it's easy for us to study. However, what do we know from statistics about the vast majority of you? Are you going to go to work for GM, the vast majority of you? You're not. Probably most of you will spend most of your career working for small to mid-sized businesses. Businesses like Petra Industries, which started here in Edmond, Oklahoma. And if you bought things in this region from Best Buy Online and it's an accessory to an electronic, it probably actually came from Petra Industries. They're, uh, they're sort of a middleman. They're not one that you necessarily know anything about. But if you bought something from Best Buy, it may have come actually from Petra Industries. They're, you know, a several hundred million dollar, the last time I, I knew anything about them, because I had friends that worked there, uh, gross corporation. Started out as, as a little company and a rented storage unit here in Edmonton. And that's the kind of company most of you are going to go work for. Or maybe some of you will actually start your own businesses and become entrepreneurs. Anybody want to do that? Anybody want to become an entrepreneur? Okay, so we've got some people that want to start their own business. And so you'll, you'll start out probably you're not going to start with a, an initial public offering on Wall Street as a small business owner. And so you're going to have to build up. So having said that the text talks a lot about big corporations, I also want, and they're important. It's not that they're not important, and we will talk about that. But I also want to make this discussion relevant to you. So when we talk about strategy, we're going to be talking about goals. What is a goal? Let's, let's think about this from a, from a personal perspective. You're going to market yourself. I told you that one thing that makes this class unique is that you, from the very beginning of your existence until the moment that you die, will engage in marketing. You're constantly marketing yourself to other people. You want people to like you. And you're going to sell yourself to the job market. You're going to market yourself to a business and you want to be successful. At, at this endeavor. So let's talk about goals. Let's talk about strategy from an individual level. And then we'll work our way up. If we can figure it out maybe at the individual level, we can work our way up to maybe what makes successful corporations. Because ultimately, a lot of these corporations, like Ford, which is one of the most successful companies in history, started out as a what? Did Henry Ford start out as a billionaire? He didn't. He started out as a small company. And in fact, the big automakers that were custom at the time, custom automakers, tried to put them out of business. They didn't want that kind of competition. So we're going to have to start out. So what is a good, or what's a goal? Let's start with, let's just start with the basics. What's a goal? It's a checkpoint to achieve a purpose. A what? A checkpoint to achieve a purpose. Okay, or something to achieve a purpose. a purpose. All right, anybody else? Have ideas about goals? What are goals? An end result. An end result. Okay, so we can do a means ends test. You have a means, and I talked about this before, to an end. That there should be some connection here called the nexus between them. And once again, we keep putting out the they keep putting these markers that are going dry. Mm -hmm. Here, here's one that's actually going to write means to an end. And there should be some connection, which we call a nexus. Okay, so an end result are all end results necessarily the product of a goal, or are they just a result of you achieve the end of the day, you survived it? I think a, a desirable. A desired result. Okay. So a desired result. Like where you want to be goal. So something that you actually think about. Because you achieve something at the end of every day. Did you intend to achieve it? What's the 
It's called you, you lived. You survived <laughs> another day among the walking wounded. And and you know, what is that a goal? It could yes, it could be. You, you, your goal could be one day at a time. You could work those steps. Thirteen steps, right? You know, to recovery. So maybe, that may be your goal, just to survive the day. Most of us are going to survive the day, hopefully. God willing. You know, although it's not wood. We're going to survive the day. So what else is a goal? Something you aspire to accomplish. Something you aspire to accomplish. So again, a desire to accomplish an objective. OK, I think these are good ideas. Now. Is it, what makes it a good goal? What's a good goal? Smart. Smart. What makes it smart? What makes a goal smart? Specific, measurable, attainable. Okay, somebody looked at the PowerPoints, didn't they? <laughs> Before. Almost every class I've ever taken has had that. Okay, very good, that's correct. There are, what makes something a good goal is, it's an objective, according to your text on page 30. What's a good goal? It's specific <clears throat> and objective. Now when we talk about consumer behavior, I will ask you a question, we'll do a critical thinking challenge on this, about whether or not it is capable, you are capable of, so you should start thinking about this now, are you capable of pursuing an irrational objective from a rational perspective? Think about that. We'll come back to this. So it's specific and objective. What do we mean by specific and objective? Well, it should be measurable. realistic. That's not to say that you shouldn't have stretch goals, but they should be realistic. So let's take one of your goals. What's the goal? To get your bachelor's degree. Okay. Is that a good goal? You all are shaking your head. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, all right. I'm not going to disagree since you all have, you know, you're shaking your heads. That's a good goal to get a bachelor's degree. You're going to throw darts at the dartboard to decide what that degree, you know? Oh, underwater bird calls. <laughs> that sounds like a good, good degree. Is that how you're going to choose your, just like flip through the catalog, open up the page? There we go. I, when I was getting my undergraduate degree, my last semester, I, I took all of my really hard courses. I was one of these that tried to take everything that was hard in advance so that my last year I could just sort of skate through. And you had to, at that time, I don't know, do you still have to, at the undergraduate level, take a physical education requirement? Is that still required in our undergraduate? Well, we used to take a physical ed or like another elective course. Okay. You, don't, well, you actually had to take six hours when I was an undergraduate of some kind of physical education. Now, what constituted physical education was sort of debatable. You know, I mean, they, they let you take they bowling. Say, hours or five, 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 hours. Is bowling a sport? Be careful. Yes. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On ESPN, they now broadcast drone racing. Yes. <laughs> It's on ESPN. Because it's on ESPN doesn't mean sport. What is the SPN network? It's not. No. So they just broadcast the sport. Yeah. 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 It's on ESPN uh, as well, isn't it? Well, anyway, it's <laughs> on right there, so. No, it's, so you think poker's a sport? No, I don't. You don't think poker's a sport? Why is it not a sport? Like, so my department chair and I both have horses, 
and we debate. She doesn't. She doesn't think that a lot of the things in the world of, of the horse world are actually sports, and I think they are. Um, she doesn't think, for example, what horse racing is clearly a sport. Yeah, she'll agree to that. She'll, and I, I guess she agrees to that because she has race horses. She actually, Dr. Ward Gray actually has horses that race at Remington Park, and so she thinks that's a sport. And the reason she thinks that it's a sport is because there is an absolute objective measurement for the outcome. You know who came in first, second, and third. Even if it requires a photo finish to do this, you can figure that out. You can figure out whether who won, right? Even if it's by a nose, you can figure out who won. And so she thinks that's a sport because there's this like objective. She doesn't think that things like dressage are necessarily, and I think that is a sport. She doesn't think that's a sport because she thinks it's subjective. Because how do you win at a dressage competition? Anybody know? Judges. Yeah, you have judges that basically look at your trials and determine whether or not they think you've got the best one. And she doesn't, she, she thinks that's subjective and so it's not a sport. So based on that criteria, and you know, I have these debates with her, like you said, somebody said poker, you said poker, right? Is that a sport? Because it's objective, isn't it? I mean, there is some physical activity, and there's, and there's a clear winner. Even if it's by one, <coughs> right? You have a first, a second, and a right? You, well, and in the World Poker Series, don't they play until somebody wins the entire? Yeah. Like you, you, you play until you're broke, and there is one winner, and you can tell who came in second basically by who was the one that played the guy who comes in with the with the entire pot. And you, I guess you can figure out who, at what point you know the third player left. You know, in terms of what you know, how much money they lost or whatever, um, or how much they were able to amass throughout the tournament. But there is some objective standard to that. So, again, going back to this idea of um, specific and objective, I I put off my till my last semester of school taking the, the courses that I thought would be complete and utter fluff. So I'm going through the catalog because I could take anything at that point. I had to take one of my PE requirements. Uh, so I took weightlifting because I liked, I liked weightlifting. And um, I think I took golf. And then I also took a course, I just could take any other elective that last semester. I'm going through the catalog and there was a, there's an entire degree program that we have here at UCO called Recreation and Leisure. And I thought, oh, that's neat. I, I, I'm good at recreating, right? I'm, I'm, good at, I'm good at recreation and leisure. I'll take that class. There was an introduction to recreation and leisure lifestyles, and I thought, oh, that's, that's right up my alley. I can figure this out. So if I, you know, should I just go through the catalog, going back to this idea of a goal of, of specifically measurable? Should I just go through the catalog? No, you know, there's a degree in recreation and leisure. I think I'll do that. Is that what I, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, Satisfy the goal of graduating with my bachelor's degree, right? But what are the jobs like? What are you going to do with a, with a degree? This is why you should consider sales, because I can tell you what you're going to do with a degree in sales. You're going to make money. <laughs> and that's a good goal. <laughs> Maybe not the highest goal, but it's a good goal. What, what are you going to do with a degree in recreation and leisure? What, what, what sports can you do? What? You can be the director of camps. Yeah, exactly. That's what they do. They, they, they run things like camps for kids. They run the Edmund Parks and Recreation Department. They, it's a degree program that you know, a lot of gyms will hire them to, to run gyms. Various, you know, at one point in time when Chesapeake was going great guns and hiring everybody on the planet and building the world's biggest campus down on Western Avenue, they hired a uh, guy who had a degree in recreation and leisure to run their what? They had a wellness center there. And you could take you know an hour out of your day and go down to the wellness center and work out. The idea was that it's overall better for the company. Because so that, that's that's the kind of job you're gonna get. But are there a lot of those jobs actually out there? <coughs> there aren't. There are not a whole I mean, you know, how many directors of recreation do we need here in Edmond? Well, so what are you going to get? You're going to get an assistant director job. What is that? I mean, so what does it pay? Not much. Not a whole lot. I mean, unless you're the director of Edmund Parks and Recreation, you know, you're going to you're going to 
You're going to be the, okay, with this degree, you're going to be the assistant director who's over the aquatic center? <laughs> well, geez, that's a job that takes all of how many months out of the year? Three. Three? Because they close the Edmund Aquatic Center at what point? When do they close it? But it gets cold. They die, they close it long before. We have September's, I remember one September when we had 15 days of over 100 degree heat, and that aquatic center was closed. When do they close it? What's the historic closing of pools? Labor Day. Labor Day. It's this weekend. This weekend is Labor Day weekend coming up. How many of you have plans for the Labor Day weekend? They're going to hang out on the pool and barbecue and grill. So, you know, I mean, that's, so what, what would make this a better goal? I'm going to graduate with a degree in professional sales. <laughs> is that a good goal? Within, within the next two years. Okay, now you've made it even, even better goal. Because what? Now you've said, I want a specific degree, not I'm going to throw darts at the board and choose my major by doing that, or by rummaging through, or by rolling dice and going to the page number of the dice that I rolled. Now we've got, I've got a specific degree program and a temporal aspect to that, which is I want to graduate with that degree in the next two years. So it's specific, now it's really measurable. We can tell whether or not we achieve the goal in two years. You can see whether or not you've got your bachelor's of business administration in professional sales. And if you don't, you can do what? You can modify it. Now what do I mean by realistic? You can have a specific, you can say, I'm going to get a bachelor's, I'm going to start from zero Right out of high school, I'm going to get a bachelor's of business degree in professional selling, and I'm going to do it in two and a half years. Is that a good goal? Why not? It's not realistic. How, how many credit hours do you have to have to have a bachelor's degree? 124. This comes rolling right off the tongue. You all know. We watch that window and see as it's getting, it's getting closer and closer to graduation. So you have to have 124. Can you possibly get 124 hours in two years? You have to take 30 hours. And the summer, and you're only allowed to do how many? You're only allowed, and at 24, how many people can do 24? Not many. It's 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 really hard to do that. It would be really really difficult to do it, if not impossible to do it. I suppose if you you know did nothing but um, took classes, you did every intercession that you could, you clucked out of a whole bunch of, it may be, it may be possible if you clucked out, one of my friends in high school clucked out of the first two years of college, she basically started as a junior because she clucked out of all of the American national government, the U.S. history, the foreign language requirements, all of that. She did, you know, the English and she was, she was pretty bright and she was able to do that. So, it, but for most people, it's probably not realistic. So it should be realistic. Not that you shouldn't have, again, stretch goals for yourself, but they should be somewhat realistic. They used to ask every year, the VISTA used to have the survey, where do you think you'll be by the time you're 30? And overwhelmingly, students on UCO's campus said that they were gonna be millionaires by the time they were 30. Uh, I was one of those that said that as well, and we see how that turned out poorly. So. So, goals are also going to be de dependent upon the individual and the organization. So as an individual, one of the things that makes marketing really, really interesting is that although I would love for all of you to become professional sales majors, we know that you're not. Some of you are going to stick with accounting, even though I don't know how you'll stay awake long enough. But you're going to stick with accounting. Why? Because people are different. That's what makes marketing really interesting, is what we call the variance. What is the variance? It's what we call a measure of dispersion. This, this formula, sigma x i minus the mu squared over n. That's what we call the variance. This is what we call a measure of dispersion. There's all kinds of different degrees out there and all kinds of different people that want different degrees. So there's a lot of variance there. All kinds of variance. 
you can measure the intensity with which people want to get certain degrees. So for organizations, it's going to depend on what type of organization we are. And marketing is used not just by businesses, and we talked about this last time in terms of these evolving definitions of marketing. So going back through those definitions of marketing, marketing starts out as being the processes that result you know, in the flow of goods from producer to consumer. That's the original definition of marketing. And I said there's a problem with this definition. And a lot of you picked up on a lot of the problems with the definition. First of all, it's only one way. The flow is from producer to consumer. What else is wrong with it? Only talked about businesses. And we now recognize that all kinds of organizations are going to use marketing, not just businesses. So there's four profits. That's the vast majority of the ones that we study. And particularly in the College of Business, we study these four profits, although we do offer courses, and I've offered them in the past. And for example, one of the classes that I've taught is called Political Marketing. It's one of my favorite classes to teach because my undergraduate and master's degree were actually not in business. They were in political science. That was what I really wanted to be was a political scientist. And so I have this real interest in politics, and so I've taught a course in political marketing. So candidates use marketing to try and be successful. Not only candidates, but what other kinds of organizations try to use political marketing? What do we call them? Huh? Red Cross. Okay, they do, they market, what? Interest groups? Interest groups, absolutely. Interest groups use marketing in the political marketplace to try and influence public policy. Things like what? Like a PAC, the, the Christian Conservative PAC, the AARP, the labor unions form PACs and things like that, and they try to organize and, and influence public policy. So. Um, we have others, besides the for-profits, we have all these non-profits, things like political marketing, PACs, what else, what else falls into the non-profit realm that uses marketing that we talked about last time? What's going to happen in, in Houston and other areas that are affected? What's one of the major groups that's going to go in and try and help people out? FEMA. FEMA, that's a governmental organization. What's the other one? Red Cross is going to be another one. That's a non-profit that's going to go in, and they use marketing as well. And it's not just marketing in terms of trying to raise funds. One of the things that this foundational start of marketing is actually, I told you, it's born of two foundational disciplines, economics and psychology. And it was largely founded as a result of an outgrowth of a very specific kind of economics called agricultural economics, where these agricultural schools, like at the University of Wisconsin, what do they have a lot of uh, in Wisconsin? Cheese. Cheese. They have a lot of cheese. They did these cheese studies. How do you get cheese from producer to consumer in a way to keep it from spoiling? So a lot of the early marketing studies are actually logistics type studies. And one of the people who does an interesting study, who's not a marketer, but she does what's kind of a traditional marketing study, is a woman named Rose George. And she writes a book. This is always a good test question. 90% of everything. And what she does in that book is she gets on a container ship in England and follows it through. She gets on a container ship that's owned by the Maersk Line. And you probably have <coughs> some knowledge of the Maersk Line, if for no other reason than a bunch of you have probably seen a Tom Hanks movie called Captain Phillips. How many of you have seen that movie? Okay. How many of you have heard of that movie? Captain Phillips, a few of you. So Captain Phillips was actually the captain of uh, the Maris, what? Alabama, when it gets caught in pirate waters off the coast of Somalia and taken uh, hostage, gets hijacked for ransom. So she gets on this container ship that's owned by Maris, and she follows it around to see how this works. And if you start out, she starts out by asking people around England, how much of your stuff do you think arrives by shipping? And most people say, well, not much. Maybe 10%, 25% was the highest that anybody guessed. What's the percentage of stuff that actually arrives by shipping? 90%. 90%. So, um, Apple actually does ship their iPhones, their iPhones differently than other manufacturers like Samsung of 
phones, but most of the others ship their products on container ships from China. They're manufactured largely in China because China has what? They have cheap labor, they're developing skilled labor, and so they ship most of this. Now, Apple actually ships theirs, and I believe they have contracted with a uh, company that has a fleet of basically C-130s that, that ship them over so that they get them here very quickly. But everybody else ships their uh, phones pretty much by and large on container ships. And one of the things that she details in this book is how much it costs to ship, and but people are also amazed. So first of all, they don't know that 90% of everything comes to you in some form or fashion by water, even here in Oklahoma. We have two major ports here in Oklahoma that go all the way to the sea. I have a boat on one of them at the port of Muskogee. The most northern and western port until you get to the west coast is one port up from where I have my boat at the port of Muskogee. It's the port of, anybody know? Catusa. And we ship massive amounts of stuff out of here and we also receive massive amounts of goods and services from other places into those ports. At the Port of Muskogee, one of the things that's uh, shipped in there is huge, huge, large ships full of sand from Saudi Arabia, which they use to then make, anybody know what tile company is in Muskogee? It's a Dockle Tile Company. They make huge amounts of tile, and then that shipped all over the world. So 90% of everything is shipped on container ships, what do you think it costs to ship an item the size of an iPhone? So we'll say a Samsung, what's the equivalent of the iPhone? This is an iPhone 7, I think. Um, um, what's the SA equivalent? Plus. A what? SA. Okay, an SA Plus. For the, I guess the Galaxy is gone because it kept blowing up, right? No, that's a Galaxy SA. Yeah. Okay, oh, Galaxy SA. Okay, so um, what, which one was the Galaxy that kept blowing up? No, fine. No, no. Okay, so that one's gone, but they've now got a different version of it. What do you think it costs to ship this from China to the United States on a container ship? Not much. Not much. Yes. Less. Oh, 10 cents? Less. Two cents. Less. Huh? Two cents. More. Three cents. Less. Three cents. I said three cents. Three cents. That's what it costs to ship. So, for profit, not for profit, and then governments also use marketing. The military, they want you to join, so they use advertising promotion. They also look at these kinds of studies, like logistics studies, in terms of what? What do you have to have if you have an army? Money. You have to have money and you have to have what? Support, Support for that army in terms of medical. what? Medical. You have to have medical, you have to have food, they have to have stuff to shoot, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get that to them? That's logistics, that's marketing. So there's a big part of this uh, in logistics that the military actually uses. So the type of organization that we are is going to determine what our goals are. So what is the goal for, and for most of what we'll talk about in this course, even though I teach political marketing and I teach nonprofit marketing, most of what we'll focus on in here is going to be for profit. So. What is the goal of a for-profit organization? To make money. Now, there are some interesting sort of hybrids now that are emerging that are engaging in what we call social entrepreneurship. What's an example of social entrepreneurship? What is Tom's? How many of you have heard of Tom's? A few of you have heard of Tom's. What makes Tom's a socially entrepreneurship company? They do exist to make money, but they also do what? They give back. And what's their goal? Yep, it's one for one. If you buy a pair of shoes, they donate a pair of shoes. There's another company that started on the same kind of model, and I hear it on the radio, uh, advertised all the time, that does socks. And they, they wanted to give away basically a million pairs of socks, and they thought that it would take 10 years to do this. And they achieved that goal, I think, in two years. Now, why would you want to engage in social entrepreneurship? So they do want to make money, but they also engage in social entrepreneurship. Why would they want to do that? Better media consumption? Maybe. There, there is a, a, an idea that maybe it's inherently selfish. People want to do business with people that they think are what? Doing the right thing and socially responsible, I think that's right. So, but for most for-profit 
corporations, what is their goal? It's to make money. And if you're a big corporation, the goal is to make money for who? For yourself. For yourself? In theory, you might be right if you're the CEO that their goal is to make money for themselves, but in theory, it's the, the, the CEO is not necessarily a shareholder, it probably is, but it's to make money or to increase shareholder wealth. So for profit, what's the goal of a non-for-profit? Well, it's not to make money, although they do, but what is their, what if they do, if they make a profit, what are they supposed to do with that profit? It goes towards their cause. It goes towards their cause. It goes towards supporting that cause to which they, um, to which they advocate. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that the people who run it aren't making a lot of money. I can tell you that the head of the Red Cross is extraordinarily well paid. It's, it's well over six figures to be the head of the Red Cross or to be the head of any sort of big nonprofit is, is a way of making a lot of money. And then of course governments, what is the purpose of the government? To provide services to their people? To provide services to the citizens. Although, if you are jaded in Machiavelli, you would say that in, in Machiavelli's most famous work is probably the called what? The Prince. The Prince. And he would say that the purpose of the government is to what? Instill fear. To perpetuate its existence. He wouldn't say it's to, to instill fear. That may be a side product of it, but it's to perpetuate its existence. But in theory, at least in democratic governments, we say that the goal is to provide services to people. So what kinds of services does the government provide? How'd you get here today? On your horse? <laughs> you got here on state highways, so that's a service that the government provides to you through your tax money. And to get that, they of course rely on marketing. How do they rely on marketing for that? Well, first of all, the government has to have some legitimacy to get you to give up your tax money, your hard-earned money. We generally, that's a pretty low bar in terms of marketing, but um, what else do they use? They use logistics uh, kinds of uh, principles and things like that to get stuff to the roadway where you know you're paving it. I noticed out here on uh, I-35 between Oklahoma City and Norman, it's constantly under construction. It's under construction again. They're using supplies, that's logistics and things like that. So the goals are going to be dependent upon the type of organization. In for profits, then we can uh, further look at these, and the goals are going to be different, maybe depending on the type of for profit that we have. So, what kinds of for profits do we have? What's the simplest form of organization to start in terms of a business? Corporation. Uh, a sole proprietorship, which is also called a, it's listed on the screen there. DBA. A DBA. You're doing business as. What do you have to do to be a DBA? Now, when we think about these goals and stuff like that, you shouldn't confuse the substantive law, and one of the things that we will talk a lot about in here is the regulatory environment that is required for you to operate a business, and that's going to be really, really important in something that we talk about called the environmental scan. So you shouldn't confuse the substantive area of the law with the ease of starting a certain business. So for example, what kind of business could I start that I wouldn't have to, in general, with a DBA, you don't have to let anybody know you're starting the business. You can simply hang out a shingle, and this is my example here, is what kind of business can I start that you can't start? And I don't have to tell anybody I'm gonna start it. But it's an example of how I don't have to go down and I don't have to file with the uh, Secretary of State to incorporate. I don't have to let anybody know in terms of the health department to get occupancy permits or anything like that. I can simply hang out a shingle and start this business without telling a single soul that I've done it. What can I do to do that? That you can't do. Law firm? That you can't do. What? Law? Yeah. You can't be a lawyer. I, at least, I don't think any of you can be lawyers because you're in an undergraduate class and to be a lawyer you have to have gone to Law school. law school and then pass the, the Oklahoma Bar exam, right? So again, don't confuse the ease of starting this type of organization, the, the organizational part of it, with the substantive requirements of the law. When we talk about a DBA and saying that it's the easiest to start, it means that you don't have to go down and file a corporation, commit the corporation papers with the Secretary of State, you don't have to keep minutes of your board. But if you do start something like a lemonade stand, you're probably going to have to at least deal with the government 
from a limited perspective, not in terms of an organizational perspective, but you're going to have to get things like what for your lemonade stand? Lemonade. You're going to have to get a health permit so that they know that you're not doing what with the lemonade? Poisoning. Yeah, you're not poisoning the lemonade, you're not serving rancid lemonade, you're not violating the health codes, things like that. But in general, uh, I could go and I could start the DBA, I could start a law firm and I don't have to tell anybody. I, I, and what's the nice thing about a DBA? What's the nice thing from a tax perspective? It can also be a disadvantage from a tax perspective. What's the nice thing about the DBA? There are no corporate taxes. I just I, I start my law firm, or I start my law practice, my solo practice by myself, and I hang out my shingle, and I have Grant and Gary attorney at law, and I start taking clients. I don't have to file what? Two sets of income, I don't have to file two sets of tax returns. I don't have to file a corporate return. I just file what? I just file personal taxes, that's it. Don't have to tell the state that I'm in business, anything like that. What could you do that you don't have to tell the state about and run as a business that doesn't require even the health permit? Well, when I first started teaching here years and years and years ago, the first student that I had that took multiple classes from me came and he graduated and he said, I got my degree and I just wanted to tell you I got a job offer in marketing and it was for $35,000 as a marketing communications person for a company. And I said, that's great, Dustin. That's a really good job offer. This was uh, 20, this is my 25th year. So this would have been like 20 years ago. And he said, yeah, the problem is that I started mowing yards in Edmond when I was a kid in high school. And I made $275,000 last year mowing yards. And I said, well, if your degree taught you anything, it's that you need to keep mowing yards. <laughs> you know, that, that's what you, you got a talent for this. And he didn't actually mow yards. At this point, he wasn't actually out there mowing yards. He was doing what? He was running a business. Do you have to have any special licenses or permits to run? No. You can grab yourself a lawnmower and a weed eater and go door to door and, and start your your uh, lawn mowing service. Don't have to have. So the point of this discussion is that at this level, these DBAs, these small businesses, generally the goals are much more narrow. And a lot of times these small businesses are focused on what we call survival. Just trying to survive. Just trying to make it to the next. What's the next type of business that you can form? Let's say you've got two people that want to mow yards together. You can now have a what? A partnership. And the benefit of a partnership is that what? Split liability. What? Split, uh, you can split, you, you split the liability, although in theory you're jointly and severally liable, which means that you can be liable for his, when he, when he shoots that rock out of the mower and hits the old lady next door in the eye, they're going to now sue who? They're going to sue both of you, right? But you can maybe increase your revenues because now you've got not one person out there mowing yards, you've got what? Two. And then, so you've got some more energy. At the, the next level up, uh, and this of course we can divide corporations into various types. What most big companies are are corporations. And now even smaller people are incorporating and why are they doing that? Well, it's for the advantages of getting what? Limited liability. So that you're not you're not liable for everything that, that happens that you do as a corporation. So the type of for-profit that we are is also going to influence the goals that we have. These sort of structural things are going to influence the goals that we have for our organization as well. So there are long-term goals. And there are short-term goals. And again, the text talks about this in terms of large organizations. Let's think about this. <coughs> from an individual perspective to make this relevant to you. What are some long-term goals and what are some short-term goals that you have that are, that are part of your strategy? So you've set the goal of graduating from UCO with a degree in professional sales in four years. That's a that's a objective, specific, measurable, and realistic goal, isn't it? Can you graduate in four years? Yeah. Absolutely. That's why we call it a what? A four-year degree. Now, the reality is that the vast majority of people don't graduate in four years anymore. 
do they? What's the average to get a bachelor's degree? Now? It's five and a half to six years. Why is that? <clears throat> that is one thing. People change their majors. Yes, they come in to this marketing class. They are absolutely opposed to being professional salespeople. And then they hear they can make over $150,000 in their first year. And hallelujah, they've seen the light. And they go change their major. And you know, they've had 25 hours in some worthless program like biology uh, across campus over there. And you know, well, you're, you're going to lose those. So yeah, that's one reason. People change, people, you know, they, they come to campus. And a lot of people think that I never would have said, if you had told me, you know, when I was 18 and going off to college, that I was going to become a marketing professor, I would have said, you're crazy. That was not, that was not what I wanted to do. I was going to be a big building lawyer. That was what, I mean, that's what my goal was, was to go be a big building lawyer. And I, I said that from the time I was a little kid. I said that from the time I was four years old, that I wanted to be a lawyer, and I wanted to be a big building lawyer. That's, you know, like corporate attorney. And I, I got there and I realized, like, this really sucks. <laughs> it really, really, like, filing 10 Qs and 10 Ks is really boring. You know, it's really, really, you know, you can make a lot of money doing it, but it's really boring. And so, you know, I saw the light and I became a marketer, a marketing professor instead. Because I had a friend who said, I had taught classes, I had taught law classes and stuff like that, and he said, you know, I think you'd make a really great marketing professor. And he was a marketing professor, and I thought, you yeah, know, crazy. What, what? And he said, let me tell you why you want to be a marketing professor. Sort of the same way I'm telling you you want to be a professional sales. He said, look, the average starting salary for a marketing professor is $160,000, and there are 12 jobs for every marketing candidate that graduates with a PhD. And just like you, who are going to see the light about professional sales, I went, hallelujah, I, I have seen it. I can do this, and I can have a much better life than I could have uh, as, as a lawyer for a publicly traded company. So uh, what are some of these you know, long-term goals? Well, your long-term goal in this is to graduate with your degree in accounting or finance or professional sales or whatever, what are the short-term goals that, that are going to help you? Classes. Yeah, the, the short-term goals are going to be things like, well, first of all, you've got to figure out, again, now you, you've scientifically decided how you're going to go about getting this or what degree you're going to get. Are you going to take the course catalog and throw darts at it to determine which classes you're going to take to get that degree? No. You're, you're going to figure out that if you want to get a degree in accounting, I'll stop picking on the accountants for a minute and I'll, I'll say, if you want to get a degree in accounting, what are you going to have to do? Well, you're going to have to do all of those prerequisites in the undergraduate catalog and the top half, things like American National Government. But then you're going to have to do the specific requirements for the degree. So you're not just going to take recreation and leisure lifestyles and weightlifting and all of these other things. You're going to take what? Accounting one, accounting two, intermediate accounting, cost accounting, uh, auditing, you're going to take these courses and you're going to take them in a way that makes sense, right? Those are short-term goals. And, and your short-term goal is to what? As you said, pass your classes. Get that, you know, 12 or 15 hours a semester. So long-term and short-term goals. So structural dimensions, Roger Darrow. At the major corporation level, so if we have a big corporation like Ford, it probably has various subsidiaries, or what we call strategic business units. So how they organize their goals and things like that from a broad to more narrow. So at the corporate level at Ford, so Ford has got Ford. What else does Ford own? What else is under the Ford corporate umbrella? What? Lincoln is also under Ford. What else? Mercury is under Ford. What else is under Ford? Anything else? You should what do you 
which car company owned for a while they sold the Jaguar? Was that Ford or was it Chrysler or was it GM? I can't remember. Um, at one point, the Jaguar has now been sold to I think a Korean company. But at one point Indian. in time, what? Indian company. Indian company. Okay. They've been sold to an Indian company. But at one time, an American car company actually bought Jaguar. And I think it was Ford, wasn't it? Yeah. Ford bought Jaguar. So that was a strategic business unit. What's another strategic business unit that's not just related to cars? Uh, it is sort of related, but it's, a, it's actually one of their most profitable strategic business units in their company. Ford Motor Credit. So what is Ford Motor Credit's goal? What do they, what do they want to do? They want to finance your vehicle purchase. See, they want, when you buy a new vehicle from Ford, they're going to do what? They're going to finance that. So at the corporate level, so for a while, Bill Ford, who is the grandson of Henry Ford, came back and was CEO of the company. He's no longer CEO. He's now what they call the executive chairman of Ford and Avenue CEO. But when he was CEO, what is it going to be? What kinds of things is he going to be looking at in terms of goals at this Umbrella Corporation. So we've got Ford. We'll say this is the the uh, the umbrella. We've got Ford. So we've got Ford, Lincoln, Mercury. At one time, Jaguar. Um, Ford Motor Credit. So what kinds of things is he going to be looking at in terms of setting goals? In contracts? Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be looking at things like increasing revenue for the company as a whole. So that all strategic business units are focused on what? Generating revenue. Is he gonna be talking about, you know, should we release a new version of the Mustang? No. Right? He's gonna look at this sort of broad <coughs> what is it that Ford is wanting to do? <clears throat> um, broadly speaking in the market it may be setting goals like we want to increase market share over the next 10 years by 5% that's a big goal we want to increase more overall market share now at the strategic business unit they're also going to have goals so what is going to be sort of the goal of Ford the Ford line of cars or Lincoln, Mercury, <coughs> what are they going to be looking at? They're now going to be looking at more narrow goals like we want to do what? What is Ford's number one selling vehicle? And it's the number one selling truck in America, the F-150. So at Ford, you know, whoever's head of that strategic business unit is going to be saying things like what? We're going to, so at Ford, the big umbrella corporation, it's we want to increase ROI, we want to increase market share. It's going to be, we want to increase sales in our F-150 line by 5%. So we're now getting more specific. And then at the functional level, you're going to be having goals and planning for what? So for example, for departments. So the, the people in the paint department, their goal is going to be to do what? Yeah, ensure quality, paint certain numbers of cars. So it's going to be even more specific as we think about the strategy. Long-term success. Jim Collins and Jerry Price Bill, uh, wrote a book called Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. They studied 18 companies. These companies, on average, were established for over 100 years. They outperformed the market. And they looked at what makes them successful. So there's all different kinds of companies in this mix that were successful. What makes them successful? What they found was that successful companies, and I think we can, again, we can look at this big, big picture and we can use it to our advantage as an individual. What they found is that big companies that were really successful, that were established for over 100 years, outperformed the market, had a core set of values. They were deeply committed to a core set of values. Now, what are 
values. Morals, that's maybe a value, part of our value system. Ethics, deeply held beliefs. Deeply held beliefs. How do we establish these core sets of values? What? Okay, mission statements, that's good. But you just can't, you know, write it and put it out there. You actually have to instill it and believe it, right? So mission statements, these are core sets of values. How else do we establish core sets of values? What are some of your core values? Okay, such as? You find going to school, that's one of your core values. Education is a core value that you have. Why? Okay. Can better your economic position. We know that. When my mother graduated from college many, many years ago, my mother is a baby boomer. Most of you, your grandparents, are probably your baby boomers. Some of you probably have grandparents that are traditionalists, but most of your grandparents are probably baby boomers. When my mother went to college, a college degree guaranteed, for the most part, by and large, if you could get up every day and go to work and you had a college degree, it was a guarantee of at least entry into the middle class. That's no longer true today. A college degree doesn't guarantee entry into a middle class. So a lot of times when I talk to younger students, you know, friends of my nieces and nephews and things like that, and they say things like, I just don't think I should go to college because it's not worth it. It's not necessarily a guarantee of achieving a middle class lifestyle. I'll say, yeah, that's right, it's not. But I can guarantee that not achieving it is almost a guarantee that you will not what? You will not achieve middle class status. Or it will be very difficult. It's no longer necessarily a guarantee. So this is one of your core values, that you value education. So they have these core values, these strong held principles that they're passionate about, enduring companies like Southwest Airlines, which engage in what we call living the brand and has outperformed, is one of the few airlines in the history of the airline industry to never have gone broke. All the others, for the most part, and some of them have, have gone broke more than once. Went broke, filed bankruptcy. American went broke. Some of them never emerged from bankruptcy after they filed uh, uh, Chapter 11. Never emerged. Pan Am. How many of you have heard of Pan Am? like the, the icon of the airline industry for years. Dawn, the way of the dodo. Why has Southwest been successful? Well, they, they really have a core, core, core corporate culture that instills these values that are really, really, um, they have the lowest turnover. Does Southwest pay the most of any of the airlines? They don't. But they have the most committed employees. Yeah. Um, so, um, what I remember is that Southwest copied uh, from another airline company. So, what made them different from that airline company? I don't think Southwest copied from another airline company. I mean, if, if you, uh, they had a really unique model. First of all, they started out flying solely in the state of Texas. So, they, were, they weren't regulated by the federal government for a long time in terms of because they were an intra-state uh, airline, they were not an interstate, and according to Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, Congress regulates interstate commerce, they don't regulate intrastate commerce. So Southwest actually started out as this regional airline that flew basically oil men between Dallas and Austin and Houston. Now I suppose you could say there were other airlines that, that did that at that time, that flew sort of regionally, and maybe they copied that, but they, and everything else, they were really unique. They only flew, for example, to this day, Southwest only flies what? How many models of airplanes? One. One. They only fly one model of airplane. Why is that good? Let's talk. What? It's consistent. That's right. 
Less cost. How is it less costly? You what? You only have to have one set of you know A and P mechanics that know this airplane. That that costs less money. If you're talking about storage space, storage space for parts for airplanes is expensive because it takes up large footprints, right? You have to have these parts. And if you only have one model, you know, if you have if you have a 747 and a 737 and DC nines and all these other and you know Canadian regional jets which American has, if something happens to that airplane. One of the reasons that Southwest is always on time or it's had a better record of because if something happens to that airplane and it goes down, they can simply pull another airplane and replace it very quickly. Whereas if you're flying, you know, you may have a 747 sitting on the tarmac at Dallas International Airport if you're American Airlines and you've got this airplane that goes down over here that's flying to Atlanta that's a 737. Are you going to take that 747 and fly it from Dallas to Atlanta with a half full flight? Probably not. Because you're going to do what? Lose a whole lot of money. So what do you do? You cancel the flight, you rebook people, now they're mad. I mean, Southwest has been really, really unique. And they've had these sort of core enduring principles uh, that, that have made them a model company. They live the brand. I think their company culture also really influenced how um, how they, I think that is really important to run one of the because how the CEO ran things like how um, their company, just how the employees felt, really. Yeah, progressed. employees are enormously loyal to Southwest. I mean, they have some of the highest, one of the things that has become a big thing, and this is part of marketing to employees, is a recognition there was a time at which Companies treated employees, and this is part of a, a legacy that comes from a German sociologist called Max Weber, who said that the ideal form of organization is a bureaucracy. And the reason that he said that is because he said it was efficient. What is a bureaucracy? It's a highly specialized organization, so it focuses on doing a limited number of things. It's hierarchically organized and arranged, and it has, within that arrangement, specific jurisdiction to people. So the idea was that if a person wasn't doing their job, they were like a cog in a machine. You could pull them out of the, of the machine and replace them with a new cog. That influenced a lot of management theory for a long time. The idea was you could, nobody was, a lot of management uh, theory focused on this idea that nobody was irreplaceable. And that's true, but the issue is at what cost? Visionary companies like Southwest have recognized that it costs a lot to replace somebody. It costs a lot in terms of training, recruiting, finding, hiring. And so you need to market to your internal customers as well. Now one of the things that's interesting about this enduring passionate principles is that some of the companies had what we would call bad values. They didn't have to be, Collins and Pariahs say, these are what make you successful, is having these enduring core tenants. And I think we look at companies like Southwest and we say, those are good values. They value their employee. They value customer service. They value being on time. And those are all good things if you're going to be an airline. Because people want, when they, I mean, flying is a miserable experience, right? How many of you, how many of you enjoy going, you just look forward with relish and glee to going to the airport and flying? <laughs> Oh, yeah, all the maneuvering uh, uh, oh, beforehand is just, it's, it's, it's actually not that bad in Oklahoma City because we have a really good airport in terms of getting people through. But go to Atlanta, start a, start a flight from Atlanta, or start a flight from Dallas International, not Dallas Love, and, and it's a horrific experience. And Southwest makes that experience less horrific. In many respects, they make that less less horrific. I was about to say, I like to fly in, I fly Southwest. Yeah, I mean, I, I had to fly for work this summer. I was doing, I was looking at internship opportunities, and there was a company that wanted to do internships for our marketing students named Gardner. And they flew me down to talk to them about placement of our students at Gardner. And they put me on Delta, and from the word go, it was a nightmare. I mean, it, it was. It, it started out as a nightmare, and it ended up as a nightmare. And it took me uh, 17 hours to get from Oklahoma City 
to uh, Fort Myers where I could have driven in, in the amount of time. Um, not all of these companies that have these core values are good values, though. Southwest, I think we can say, has got good values. Johnson & Johnson, for the most part, although there is some controversy now, particularly with the talcum powder cases that have emerged, uh, Johnson & Johnson generally has pretty good values. If you look at their mission statement and their core values, they have good values. Philip Morris, on the other hand, is a company that's been very successful, clings to their core values, not necessarily what we would say are good values. What does Philip Morris produce? They produce cigarettes. And the CEO of Philip Morris, so how many of you have seen the movie called Thank You for Smoking? A few of you. This actually occurred. They actually did this. They actually hired people to try and disprove the science behind cigarette smoking. And for years and years and years, we knew. And Philip Morris, they tried to find people that would say there was no correlation between smoking and lung cancer. And we knew that. But it turns out that it's even worse than that. It's even worse than a correlation between smoking and lung cancer. That's a big correlation and big causation. I mean, that has been really proven. What else does smoking cause? Heart attacks. It's one of the number one causes of heart attacks. What else? Huh? Lung cancer. Lung cancer, we said that. What else? Childhood deformities. What? Children uh, uh, there, are, there is some evidence to suggest that if you smoke while you're pregnant, that it does lead to uh, problems with uh, fetal development because it actually does cross the placenta and create problems. It also causes emphysema. How many of you have seen all the ads anymore for COPD? How do you get COPD? The vast majority of people who have COPD are what? Smokers. They're smokers. What else does smoking cause? There's a lot of evidence to suggest that in women it increases your risk of breast cancer. And also, by the way, can men get breast cancer? Yes. Yes, they can. It's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it increases the risk. And in fact, in recent decades, more and more men have been coming down with breast cancer. And there is evidence to suggest that that is the result of smoking. What else? It increases the risk for prostate cancer in men. Uh, and absolutely, for, yes, it's one of the leading factors of the loss of teeth and gum disease. What else? The smoking cause. Hypertension. High blood pressure. You know, I mean, it, it, there's a list of things that it contributes. And Philip Morris, the CEO, was described as ruthless cunning. He was said that he saw absolutely nothing wrong with selling people a product that they did not need. Well, it's not just about selling a product that people don't need. It goes beyond not needing it, doesn't it? It's actually detrimental to the, to the lives of your clients. So um, Philip Morris is an example. Mission statement, what do we do? One of the things that we have to be careful here, and your text talks about this on page 30, is avoiding marketing myopia. And Theodore Levitt wrote a seminal paper called Marketing Myopia, in which he says a lot, of th a lot of times we don't realize what industry we're really in. So for example, if you went back to the beginning of the 20th century, some of the largest companies in the world at that time were railroad companies. They're no longer the largest companies in the world. Why? Because they had marketing myopia. They were really good at running railroads. We don't ship as much by railroad. We still ship a lot by railroad. We don't ship nearly as much by railroad as we used to. What were they really in? They're not really in the railroad business. They really should have been focusing on what? Transportation. The transportation industry. I am out of time, so that's where we stop. <laughs>